for being here with us today. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, I'm coming here today from a budget markup where we've been debating disastrous cuts to critical investments in education, in infrastructure, workforce training programs, and healthcare. And so I appreciate the reminder in your testimony that when we talk about tax reform, we should remember that first and foremost, we need to have the revenues to pay for these basic government functions that serve as the foundations for growing a strong and a resilient middle class. Yet somehow over the years, we've moved away from this simple concept and the code has morphed into something of a monstrosity with layers of complexity that always seem to benefit the wealthiest few while everyone else is left to wonder how they keep getting left behind here in Washington. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, the Tax Policy Center has estimated that under the Republican blueprint, the wealthiest taxpayers would see an average cut, tax cut of over a million dollars, while middle class families would get around $200. And the Trump plan offers middle class families a paltry one-tenth of 1% 1 of the $1.4 million cut the richest Americans could expect to see. So at a time when my colleagues on the other side of the aisle seem bent on gutting funding for education, healthcare, and other critical resources for working families, do you think that even $200 per family is anywhere near enough to make up for what Republicans want to take away in terms of healthcare or education resources? No, not, not at all. Um, and it's a, a huge issue. We, we, of course, do a lot of work in all of those areas between job training, education, and healthcare. And we know there are great needs and, and resource needs that are there. So we're enormously concerned about that. Thank you. Um, Chairman Archer, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I imagine you know firsthand how elusive comprehensive tax reform can be. And I agree with many of the things that you said in your testimony that tax reform should not be corporate only, um, that it should be permanent to give people some ability to plan for the future and that progress is achievable this Congress. But there was one word that was conspicuously absent from your testimony, and that word was bipartisanship. And um, I believe without bipartisanship that this committee will never achieve any of the laudable goals that you outlined. And I wonder, do you agree with that? Uh, I certainly believe that it's desirable to have bipartisanship, particularly on something that is as important as fundamental tax reform. Uh, it seems to me, as with health care reform, uh, both parties should be a part of it. Uh, otherwise, it seems to me that it is not going to be as long lasting uh, as it should be. And. Um as you know, I'm, I'm new to the committee, but I've done some homework, and the 1986 tax reform process was far more extensive than what the committee has done this year. Um, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 was preceded by 30 days of full committee hearings on tax reform, five hearings in the Select Revenue Measures Subcommittee, and three hearings in the Oversight Subcommittee, and a full 26 days of markup between September 18th, 1985, and December 3rd, 1985. And the Senate Finance Committee put in the hard work as well, 36 days of full committee public hearings and six subcommittee hearings and 17 days of markup. And that's a far cry from what we're hearing now from, from Finance Chairman Hatch, who just yesterday said that the Finance Committee may not have a single hearing on tax reform this year. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record um, the legislative history of the 1986 Tax Reform Act, um, with your permission. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, Chairman Archer, do you think that the committee and Congress as a whole conducted a deliberative examination of revenue issues in the 1986 tax reform? Well, clearly the 86 tax reform uh, took a lot of time to put together. And, uh, and in the end, um, it prevailed with some very hard hitting um, pressures from the top, on both sides, I must say. Um, I was very concerned, as I mentioned earlier today, with the fact that there was retroactivity in there that was going to undermine the value of real estate. And uh, it was put in there, of course, to, to get extra revenue. And it disturbed me enough that I wanted to offer a motion to recommit with instructions. And I am convinced that I had the votes to beat the bill. 
if I had been permitted to offer that motion to recommit with instructions. Unfortunately, and I mentioned uh, that there was a lot of pressure from the top, um, the ranking Republican um, in the House was called by the White House and told that he could not let me offer the motion to recommit with instructions and um, called me into his office and told me that he was going to have to personally take it away from me. There wasn't anything I could do. The power was there. Uh, it was unprecedented because the uh, ranking Republican on the committee uh, was for the bill, so he had taken himself out of the process. I was a second ranking, and traditionally, I should have been given the motion to recommit. Uh, so those things were going on behind the scenes. And uh, in addition, of course, um, you not only had the president who signed on, but you had the chairman of the committee who was then a Democrat who was totally committed to it. And um, the pressure that he put on in the committee was pretty incredible too. So you had bipartisanship, but bipartisanship, in my view, did not produce a bill that was pressure. in the best interest of the country. Thank you. My time's but expired. But that was my own prejudice, you understand. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mark.